especially in our society, and uh, provide some solutions for those. Um, we will take uh, a 15 minute break at 12.45, and uh, you know, there's some refreshments. Feel free to help yourselves. After that, we'll come back at one o'clock and uh, open it up for Q&A. So that's the plan. Inshallah, uh, we'll end like at 1.30 and then pray Zahar, and then we can go. Okay? So Dr. Shahzad Salim, thank you. Take it away. Here or here? Uh, you can sit over here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Fatim al uh, Dear young minds, young adults, and some of the parents who are here, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to be among you, and I always find it a very refreshing experience to address the younger generation and, of course, the adults as well. Uh, but uh, as you have been just introduced to the topic, that the challenges that you face while living in a Western country. And I'm sure there are a number of things that you might have in your mind which at times uh, go unnoticed and at times you would not like to even uh, discuss them. So today is an opportunity that we have this interactive discussion as much as possible. And uh, whatever you think and whatever comes to your mind vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the challenges that you might be facing in your schools, in your colleges, in your universities, at your workplaces, and especially uh, in the environment that you live in, which, uh, of course, if you're born and raised here, is, uh, has, a, has a small problem, and that is that because your own parents generally are not born and raised here, and you are born and raised here, so therefore, at times, there is a clash between cultures. So there is this cultural impact of your parents or your previous generation, which is always there as a baggage. And uh, this actually is something which uh, has a lot of challenges. And the challenges, uh, I would say, they, they begin right in your family. It's like the challenges, uh, they are, uh, they are f you face them as soon as you start growing up in your own uh, house. So uh, the important thing that needs to be understood is that it's not the challenges outside your house, which are always there. And of course, uh, there could be a number of solutions which could be suggested. But now the first challenge you would face uh, is perhaps from your own parents. And uh, at the same time, because of the fact that parents are also here, uh, for parents as well, there are some challenges which they face uh, when they raise children uh, from uh, in a Western country and if they themselves belong to, the, uh, to, to some Eastern country, some uh, Asian country in particular. So we have a grouping of these challenges, so challenges within the family, challenges outside the family, and of course then there is a challenge which is always there, and that is for every single one of us. So it's not, uh, you see, I, I, if I start grouping these challenges, so one is a challenge which we are faced from within us, and this is something which is not confined to living in the West. It is something which is there all the time. And then there is this challenge that you face when you maybe grow up and have an interaction with your parents. And the third circle of this uh, challenge extends as you move in the society and you interact with your friends who have cultural differences, who have uh, religious differences, who have different cultural sensitivities. So I'll, I'll try to take up all these three circles, if you may call them, these three circles of challenges, so challenges within, from within you, the challenges within from within your family and then the challenges which are outside your family and extend to your friends and colleagues. So if you start off the, the challenge which, uh, which, is, which we confront and as I said the first challenge which is from within us is something which is not confined to living in the West, it's something which is uh, confined to being a human being and that is the challenge to take the right decision in the light of our conscience. You see all of us are faced with choices in life we come across things that at times we don't like. We come across a lot of uh, uh, areas in which we are tempted. Temptations are there and there are all kinds of temptations and these temptations tend to get the better of us. 
So uh, the first challenge that uh, we face is that we have to lead a life in which we always, always follow the voice of our conscience. Our conscience is the best judge to what right and wrong is. And of course, this right and wrong at times is very fundamental in nature. And at times, it, ha it has some colored aspects to it in which uh, the lines at times get blurred. And therefore, you have a difficulty in at times recognizing them. But again, as I said, this is something which you learn as you grow, grow and uh, you are able to gauge and engage with them. So uh, the first challenge that you face is that whenever uh, you come across something which is right or wrong and you have to take a decision in life, uh, we have to try our best to take the right decision. It has to be morally right, it has to be uh, religiously right, it has to be right, especially in the, in, in the areas of our morality. Uh, right and wrong is something which you don't need to go out and find out from a, from a mufti or from even your own parent. So the biggest judge of right and wrong is your own self. And it never lies. As long as your conscience is living, it never lies. And that conscience is something which is a prized possession of everything. And you know what? Socrates, the very famous scholar, he was the supposedly, of course, the uh, mentor of Plato. So he, uh, he calls this, this inner feeling of, uh, of combating our conscience and uh, as a result, uh, being able to deliver the right, what the right is, as a divine spark. So this divine spark, which is found in our own selves, is something which lets us know what the right and wrong is. And this is precisely what happened, if you remember uh, the Quranic story of Joseph, uh, in which he was tempted by a woman. And the Quran says that had it not been for this divine spark, or this feeling of attachment with God, and this, this uh, tremendous... Uh, call of the conscience that he had himself, he would have fallen for her. And he did not because his conscience was strong. And he actually obeyed the voice of his conscience. So the conscience is something that has to be followed as much as you can. Obviously, we are not angels. We, are not, we cannot be perfect all the time. At times, we do take wrong decisions. At times, we may be uh, uttering something which is an understatement. It could be even a lie. Uh, a white lie, you can call it, or a small lie. It could be something that you do in which you regret uh, always. So the, f the first challenge is that you have to be extremely, extremely uh, mindful of the fact that I, which I should try my best as far as I can to follow the voice of my conscience. And let me also elaborate on this, that following the voice of your conscience, if you want to have a strong conscience or if you have, want to have a personality which follows the conscience as far as is possible, then the, the prescription for that is to have a strong God connection. The stronger your connection with God, the stronger will be your, your emotions and feelings and your own inner inclination to take the right decision. If ha you have that God connection, your conscience will seldom falter uh, and your own volition and ability to follow your conscience will become quite easy. So that strong God connection has to be there. And for, your, for young minds as you yourself and for some of the adults here as well, uh, you have to follow what the Almighty says. And the best way to have that connection is to read the Quran as much as you are able to, uh, to connect with him. Because you see, there's no stronger connection with God than through his own word, and, which is the Quran. And in order to approach the Quran, in order to have a direct uh, interaction with the Quran, uh, just recently, I was uh, in Boston. Uh, we had a small session, uh, and there were uh, young young minds as well as their parents. And someone asked me that how should we approach the Quran, especially young minds, so that they can have a strong God connection, and as a result, also have this this inner feeling of always trying to do what is right, and for the sake of righteousness, they they, they spend their lives. So. The, I said that to me, uh, there are three or four steps which can be taken if you would, have, would like to have a strong God connection to the Quran. So first of all, you see what is important is to have an overview of the Quran. You, before you enter the book, uh, you ha must ha know what the book is all about. Because you see, we have preconceived notions about the Quran. There are so many students who I come across who, said, who, ever, who actually expressed this in not so many words, that they were disappointed in reading the Quran. And uh, why? Because when they started reading it, they thought that it's going to be a book which is going to have everything and it's going to answer all their questions. And 
Uh, and when they started off, uh, the first surah, the long surah, Surah Baqarah, dealt with the history of the Israelites. And they said, well, what's, what's that got to do with us? You see, uh, this is because of the fact that when we grow up, we get certain notions from our parents that this is the Quran and you have to read it and it's a book of guidance. And because we don't have a full introduction, uh, we tend to get uh, either bored after a couple of pages or f don't get the relevance of a lot of discussions which are uh, in the Quran. So the first thing that I would recommend, and we're still on the first step, the first step is to have a strong conscience. And in order to have a strong conscience, you have to have a strong God connection. And to have a strong God connection, you have to have a very good interactive behavior and attitude towards the Quran. So it's like all linked, and we're still on the first step. So the first thing, as I said, is to have an overview of the Book of God. And we here at Al-Murid have uh, endeavored to publish a very small booklet which actually introduces the Quran to any uninitiated reader who would like to know what the Book of God is like, what the language is, what the content is, uh, what its history is, how does it speak to people, how does it relate to previous scriptures, how does it impact our own lives. So the first thing I would suggest is that you pick up an introduction. And this is like when you, whenever you start off reading any big book, uh, it's always advisable that instead of venturing forth into the book, you have a first-hand knowledge of what the content of the book is all about. So that's the first step. The second step is don't start reading the Quran just after reading that introduction. First, get hold of a selection of the whole Quran. Again, this is a way which will connect you in an easier way to God because, you see, you start off from the beginning and being a 500 or 600 page book is not always easy to, uh, 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 e to navigate. So a better or a more, uh, I would say, sagacious way to go to the book of God is to, f after reading, the, uh, and reading an introduction to the Quran, you read some selections from the Quran. And these selections actually will give you an overall idea of the content of the Quran. And because of the fact that they are brief, and by the way, uh, here at, at al Morris also we have a publication on these selections, which will actually acquaint you with the basic me message of the Quran in a very brief format. And once this is done, so what you will have is an introduction to the whole book and also a brief introduction to the contents of the book because you have read those selections. And then comes the third step. And that is that as soon as you read those translations of the Quran, uh, you will find that there is something uh, which is really uh, inspiring you and making you go further because of the fact that you've just talked to God, spoken to God, and He's spoken to you. Uh, more often than not, the third step automatically arises uh, from these two first steps, and that is that you pick up the Quran and now start it reading from the beginning. So this is the third step. So more often than not, what do we do? We start picking the Quran, reading the Quran, without going these, through first, uh, these two steps. So this is one of the areas, bec uh, because of the fact that we don't uh, have a proper introduction, that I find so many young, young minds, and even adults, being put off by the Quran. And, uh, all, the only thing that keeps them going is that aqidah with the Quran, or maybe something which pushes them. And they might not be intellectually satisfied, but they still do it. So that is why I always suggest the third step is that you have to then pick up the translation. And then the fourth step is, uh, of course, these are gradations, and uh, the third step I, to most people would be the final step. And, but if you want to be an advanced learner in the Quran, you want to have even a more stronger connection, then the, uh, the manner in which you should lead this translation of the Quran is that read the translation as much as possible. Don't pick up a tafsir unless you have a question. You see, God is speaking to you, and he has said in his Quran that is hudal nas It's a guidance for people. And... Uh, in 90% of the cases, the translation is absolutely clear and you are able to decipher it. So what people generally do is they start reading the tafsir uh, as the modern trend is without realizing that a tafsir basically is like a dictionary. Do you read a dictionary? You don't. You consult a dictionary. So you consult the Quran also, whenever the, uh, a tafsir also. So whenever while going through a translation you have some question in mind, then pick up a tafsir or maybe call a scholar or discuss with any person that you think who is knowledgeable. So that is the way how you should read the translation. Don't pick up a tafsir. Don't go near a tafsir. That's what I always say because that's going to sidetrack you. In fact, backtrack you and you'll very soon uh, think that you are in all sorts of a, of a proglama, of a quagmire in which you're just moving in circles. So the third step uh, in reading the translation is to read it as much as possible and don't go into a tafsir unless the question is there. And the, the one part of this reading of a translation is that make it a, a consistent habit. 
it should not be the case that you start off and then suddenly you realize that you, you spent one hour on the first day and the next day is five minutes and the third day is just nothing. So even if you have a very small amount of time, the Prophet Muhammad had this very a beautiful quality which I have always uh, in, been inspired from and it is narrated in his uh, biography and his hadith that uh, he would do something when, uh, for task when he would be confronted with a task in a very small proportion but do it consistently. So instead of having a huge plan of reading the Quran, just have a very small plan, maybe 10 minutes. So, but do it every day. So what it will happen is that when you read the Quran in this way and keep on reading the Quran, it's going to build up that connection in a very, very rapid way. It's like a, if I use a modern terminology, rapid fire. So you read the Quran rapidly, it connects you to God rapidly and you have that inspiration that you need to remain connected. So this is the, this is the first uh, level of being connected to God and for most people perhaps it could be something that they could stop with but continue this for all their lives. After passing through the first two steps, pick up the third step and then remain with the third step all their lives. But then there is this case of an advanced learner. Maybe a person would like to go even further. Then the advice for him would be to pick up a couple of translations instead of just one translation and do some comparative study. So that comparative study is going to help you a lot because you see translations, they are human endeavors. I mean, people have translated the Quran and at times there are differences and nuances, very subtle nuances. So what is going to help you is that when you get a two or three translations before you, uh, you'll be able to compare these translations and this will further instigate you to have more questions in your mind and that might be very helpful in going deeper into the book of God. So this, this is something that is, which is suggested to uh, the advanced learner. And the fifth step, which again is the realm of the advanced learner, is that if he could combine this Quranic study with the previous scriptures also, like for example the Bible, because you see the Quran gives a lot of references to the Bible and it continues to give these references and because of the fact that Bible is also a word of God although it may not be in its original language but it's still there so the fifth step would be that pick up a good translation of the Bible and keep it handy before you they have they are translations I can refer them to you which have actually what they have done is that uh, relevant to every Quranic verse the corresponding biblical verse has been cited so that is a very easy way out that instead of reading the whole of the Bible, you first read the, those parts of the Bible which are directly in parallel with the Quran. So these five steps are uh, hopefully going to help you very much in establishing that God connection. And remember the thing that I said in the beginning, it has to be something consistent. If you can do it for five minutes, okay, five minutes. If it's ten minutes, then give those ten minutes every day. It's like feeding your soul. You see, when you when you uh, eat, you feed your body. When you drink, you feed your body. And we are not mere body. We are not mere physical existence. We have a spiritual existence as well. So the fodder of your soul is this word of God. If you deprive it for, let's say, one day, it's like depriving your physical body from food for one day. What does it happen? You feel weak. You don't feel like doing anything. And uh, as soon as you see food, you just gobble it whatever comes your way and it causes that imbalance. So in a very similar way, just as your body needs fodder and food to nourish and maintain itself, your soul also needs this. And the fodder of the soul or the food of the soul is this word of God. If you deprive the soul of this word of God in any way, uh, you'll become superstitious, you'll become weak uh, in your decisions, you'll become jittery, you'll get disappointed a lot, you'll get frustrated, uh, you'll get angry. So all those ailments which, which come because of a lack of God connection will start overpowering you. And finally, before I move on to the second step, so we are still on the first step. The first step is the challenge within, the challenge which we face as human beings wherever we are, not specific to the West. And that is that if you are able to do this, it's going to work wonders and that is slowly and surely start memorizing the Quran as far as you can. It's not, it's not that I'm saying that you memorize the whole of the Quran. Memorize some parts of the Quran because that's going to have a tremendous effect on your prayers. Because when you stand up for namaz and you do your prayer, 
typically we have learned a few surahs, maybe a couple of them, and that's all that we start repeating when we pray the namaz. And what happens is that it becomes a mechanical sort of a thing, a more a ritualistic sort of a thing. And we don't have that, that mental connection. And as soon as the prayer is over, we don't even remember what we said actually. This, this, is, this is often the case. But if you keep this in mind that you start increasing your repertoire of the Quran, the Quranic verses by maybe just learning half a verse every day or even a quarter of a verse and revising it. And you will not even imagine that by the end of a year maybe or six months, again, the consistency factor has to be there. So if you are at by the end of a, even six months or a year, you wouldn't realize that you have learned a couple of surahs of the Quran. And because the incentive is that when you learn the surahs of the Quran, as soon as the prayer time comes, we have to pray five times a day. And you have this, this strong urge that whatever I learned by heart, I'm going to actually recite it in the prayer. Your prayers will light up. So it has a double, it's like a double benefit that you draw. It's not only that spiritual fulfillment that you gain by memorizing the Quran. And when I say memorizing, I, of course, it goes without saying that you know what the verse is actually telling you. It's not by rote learning. It's learning the Quran and also having a very good idea of what you learned, the meaning of the Quran as well. So this is something which will really help you. And it will, extreme, it will be something which will urge you on, it will egg you on, and your own five prayers will become a very, very healthy activity, a very, an activity for, to which you would look forward to. Because, you see, you, you get a chance to recite whatever you learned, and this makes your prayers very, very uh, involving and engaging, and ultimately strengthening your faith, strengthening your soul. So remember, just as the, reading the Quran is the fodder of the soul, praying to God, and of course, uh, one of the elements of the prayer is reading the Quran, also is another element to strengthen your soul. So if you just keep on this analogy, you'll find out the rest of the ibadat or the worship rituals, like for example, the Umrah or the Zakah or the Hajj, they also are basically our expression, our symbolic expression to thank God and to connect to God. So because the prayer is something that we do almost every day, and for, uh, reading the Quran is also recommended every day. I, I just mentioned the two of them prior. Otherwise, there are other forms as well, which also are instrumental. For example, uh, going to the mosque once, once a while, if not possible every day, maybe uh, other than the Friday prayer. Because you see, the Juma prayer or the Friday prayer is, is, a, is a huge rush. You go there and you just offer the prayer and you come back. So if you are able to go to the mosque just once maybe in a week, other than the Friday prayer in which you can just enjoy that spiritual atmosphere there. Let that atmosphere drench you. Just think about God. Just think that you be there. And that is going to have that added effect. So all these steps that I've, I'm just suggesting to you are basically meant to make your personal decision making when your conscience tells you that this is right and wrong, impel you towards the right as much as possible. You see, it's not, it's not sufficient that your conscience tells you right and wrong because that's just a signal. What is more important is that you, when told what right and wrong is, you shun wrong and adopt right. So being told what right and wrong is just one indication that, that you'll get from your conscience. But as I said, uh, if you have to be a person who has these uh, inner push to follow what the right path which your conscience said, then you will have to have this, this push from the word of God and this push from your own prayer. As I suggested, these are the five steps. And I do recommend that uh, uh, slowly, I, I'm sure uh, many of you are now busy with your schools, the, your colleges have opened, and even the adults, adult people sitting here, they also are they're busy all their lives. But even if, if on a weekend maybe, or in, on weekends or on a holiday, you're, you are able to start this program. But as I said, the key to this program is consistency. It's, it's consistency that's going to really work wonders, even if it's a very small amount of time. But do it in a very, very regular way. So that was the first suggestion that I would, uh, wanted to make, that your own inner self is the biggest challenge that you face. Your own inner self is the biggest impediment in your own spiritual enhancement. So the key is in your hands. It is you who have to do this or uh, uh, sort of break away. And one part of it, before we go on to the next circle, is that uh, because you are dealing uh, with, the, with a lot of people uh, around you, so you have to prove beneficial for the society as well in which you live. So from here we start the next circle. 
then this next circle is the circle in which you interact with the society. So the first circle was in which you are at war with your inner self, not to, to be, uh, not in the typical war, but in a, in a state of conflict or in a state of decision making all the time. Now the second circle is in which now you start interacting with a society which, is, which starts off by your parents, by your siblings, and if you grow old and get married by your spouse and by your children and by the extended family. So now this is the second circle now which stares you in the eye and which is again a challenge to you. Why is it a challenge? Because you see human beings are nothing but their, their role in this, in this universe, on this, in this world is that they have to contribute and play their part in the family and in the society that they live in. If they don't do this, then they'll be like people who were given a certain task, who were given a certain opportunity, and they wasted that. So the second circle is that the first, uh, the, the first challenge of your second circle, if I can put it this way, is that, again, I'll quote Socrates, uh, the famous philo philosopher. He said, know thyself. So just as he uh, uh, directed our attention to that divine spark that he, we have in ourselves through which we can judge right and wrong, he also similarly said, know that it's a very, it's just a two, two letter or a two word sentence, know thyself. And what did he mean by that? He actually meant that assess yourself, find out your good, your, your strong points. What are you best at? And you see, uh, in the Western countries, there are schools and colleges and your parents who do help a lot in, in finding out your inner talent. They do uh, have their role to play. But if I talk about uh, in general of, of all the population, then many a time it does happen that you are not able to assess and appreciate some of the inner qualities that you have. And what, what happens is that you, when you decide your profession or you decide what you're going to do in life, uh, it's, it's at times it's because of parental pressure. At times it is because you think, oh, my brother did this, oh, my cousin is doing this, oh, my friend did this. So you don't make a conscious decision. It's like a decision which other people take. So the decision that you have to take has to be based on your own talent. And this is why Socrates said, know thyself. Judge who you are. What are you good at? You are a good artist. You're a good speaker. You could be a good writer. You're a good painter. You could be a good vocalist. So these are some of the abilities and, of course, many more which every person has in himself or herself. So the first challenge is to discover your inner self. This is the first challenge of the second circle. Discover who you are. And let me tell you that if you are able to discover that and then polish that, small, that talent that you might have, it, it might be in a very rudimentary form, a very nuclear form. But you see, as Einstein has very famously put it, that genius is 1% inspiration hmm, and 99% perspiration. What did he mean? He actually meant that if you want to become a very genius sort of a person, it's hard work all the way. That 1% is God gifted, 99% is how you use that gift of God. So if you use that 1% talent that you have and really start polishing it, what does that polish do? When you start scrubbing your shoe, it makes it shine in a very similar way. When you start rubbing your own talent and start using it to your own advantage, you'll find that it's going to grow. It's going to become a tree one day. It was a sapling. It was a plant in the form of a plant. But when you start polishing it, we started to give it manure and watered it, it became into a very lush green tree. So this is of fundamental importance because you see, you can make a difference in the society if you discover your talent at the right time. And I always say that the power of one person is, is huge because that one person can make a change in the life of other people. If you are someone who can really discover your talent and put it to use in the right way, so many other people who, who might get inspired by what you're doing, they would similarly be inspired to discover their own talents and then contribute what they can for the society. Imagine a society in which every single human being as a child, as a, as a growing up adult, is made to go through, the, through this exercise in which he discovers his own self or her own self. And then all the time what he does is that he makes this this discovery to be his passion or her passion or like a hobby and you could not be any lucky any more lucky if you are able to make this passion as your profession so if your passion can become your profession then 
that would mean that you are devoting eight or nine or ten hours to your profession and at the same time polishing your passion as well and making it grow. Imagine how it would multiply. Imagine how it would, it would blossom. So I would say that this is of fundamental importance. That the, second, the first challenge of your second circle is to know yourself. And the second challenge is that uh, you must know who your creator is. Um, it's, it's something of a, might be something of a surprise to you. Of, of course, all of us know who our creator is. But no, know more about your creator. And how can you know more, more about uh, his, the creator? Try to understand that what he is telling us, the way he converses with us, there is a logic behind every directive that he gives us. So try to understand that logic. Because that is going to make you navigate the problems of life, which is of course the second circle, in a very, very uh, responsive way. So if you are able to logically understand, for example, that why should I pray five times a day? Why is it that I shouldn't consume alcohol? Why is it that I shouldn't go uh, near, uh, near meat of the swine or uh, we have to take the Zabiha meat or some of the other questions which naturally arise in your minds? And then this, this uh, strong question that when you're living in a, in a community, especially the West, this is the second challenge of the first, of the second circle, and which is that interacting, of course, with your parents was pretty easy. But the second challenge of the second circle is that what about people who are different from you? Well, not Muslims, maybe, or even if they are Muslims, they have a different worldview. For example, they could belong to the LGBTQ community. They could be people who are atheists or agnostics. So how are we to, supposed to uh, interact with them? This is, again, a challenge. And this challenge ha can only be met if you understand that what God wanted from us has a certain wisdom behind it, has a certain logic behind it. And one of those logics is that no never cut yourself off from human beings, whoever they are, whatever their religion is, however much they would be sinners in your eyes, never cut yourself off, except there are a few cir exceptional circumstances. Because, you see, as human beings, we belong to that same family which is called mankind. We are the progeny of the same man and woman, the same husband and wife, Adam and Eve. We, imagine we are like cousins, extended cousins. So it's like a global fraternity that confronts you. So don't make these distinctions that I am this and I am that and I am better and someone else is worse than me. That, for that, God has to be the judge. So when you interact with people, don't think that you're superior and so therefore I must isolate myself from people who are less uh, righteous than me. I, I remember always, and I, I make it a point to uh, quote this uh, citation from the Bible also, that uh, once when Jesus was sitting with a lot of bad people, a lot of sinners, so you know the Jews would mock him, they would scorn him, they would ask all sorts of questions to him. So he said that why are you sitting with these bad people? What's the matter with you? Uh, you're a prophet of God. You claim to be a prophet of God. And you know what he answered? He said, I have not been sent to the righteous. I have been sent to the sinners. Because the righteous are already righteous. What good can I do except increase their righteousness? So my more purpose, my, my effective uh, uh, benefit is towards people who are astray. So if you think there are people around you who are not good, maybe people who are, I'm not talking about the extreme situation like the LGBT community. Lesser than that, there are so many other people who might be jealous of you. They might be people who, who would like to show rivalry with you. They would be, they would be people who, are, who talk, who backbite, who spread gossip against you. So what's your, what should be your reaction? Start gossiping against them? Backbiting against them? No. You start becoming an individual who actually Come, starts to come more closer to those people. How? By, for example, mentioning and appreciating their good points, not only before them, but to other people in their absence. Because you see, when you're living in a small circle, your comment to a third party for a person who was your rival and they were friends is going to get to that person as well. And that's going to really jolt him, that look what I did with him or her and look what he or she is doing to me. I'm, I was jealous of her and I was spreading all sorts of propaganda. And this person, instead of getting angry, he has actually talked about some of the good points that I have. So imagine this, this is going to change that person, or it can potentially change that person. It has the, the force behind it to change that person. So never isolate yourselves from the society that you live in. Think it's a challenge. There are all sorts of people. And if there are people 
who have certain shortcomings, remember we are also the, of the same lot. We also have our own shortcomings. So instead of condemning them, whenever you see someone who is different from you, who has a different background, or maybe in your, on your eyes is a, not, is a bad person, look at some of the bad things that you yourself do. Because all of us are bad, sort of, to, so to speak, in some other respect. And uh, I always say this, that uh, the most detestable thing in the eyes of God, as you all know, is polytheism, is shirk. And look what the Quran has told us. Uh, it, the Quran says that if your parents, they are polytheists, if they are mushrik, and if they force you to associate me with some other one or do shirk, do not obey them, do not follow what they say. But it says, Kun fid, uh, sahib hum fid dunya marufa. In spite of the fact that they are doing this polytheism, be very kind to them, extremely kind to them. So what does this message give to us? That polytheism, which is something which God says I'll never forgive, even if a person is a polytheist, we are being advised that we have to be good to such people. So what about the rest of the lot that we think is also uh, gone astray? So there could be nothing greater than polytheism. So all the rest is lesser than polytheism. So this is the third, uh, uh, th this is the next point which I wanted to make that don't isolate yourselves. And the third and the final sphere is, I, I, I call this your, the sphere of your intellect. The sphere in which it's not your, the right and wrong decision that you take. The third basically is the sphere in which you are going to behave as a human being in the intellectual capacity and in the capacity of a person who is going to deal with others. So in this third intellectual capacity, always encourage critical thinking in yourself. Don't think it's not a challenge. You know what, what we do is, what, whenever we listen to something, whenever we come across something, it could be from our parents, it could be from our colleagues, uh, we either accept it blindly, if it is at times religious, or reject it blindly, no. Always be a person who critically analyzes things. Don't reject things immediately on the face value. If something new comes to your notice, if you are made aware of some new fact of knowledge, it could be a scientific fact, it could be a religious fact, it could be a cultural fact. Don't dismiss it. So the third and final affair is the affair in which you use your intellect. And that, the, the test of that is, the challenge of that is that you always should use your intellect in a critical way. And when you use your intellect in a critical way, way, look what the Quran has said. That a lot of people would end up in hell, and when angels would ask them that why did you end up in hell, and the reason they would say is that we did not use our intellect. I, we did not use the sense that God had given us, because had we used our intellect, we would have, of course, been in a very good place. So intellectual honesty, intellectual enterprise is equally important. So the third and final affair is that Whenever you come across anything which might disturb you, which might challenge your accepted beliefs, don't dismiss it. Always critically analyze it. There, it might be true. There might be some semblance of truth in it. And it could open new doors for you. It could maybe bring up some new facts of life to you. So uh, in, these, uh, in, this, uh, in this small uh, talk, of course, it's not difficult to cover all the challenges of life. And I, my purpose was to give you some basic uh, I would say, doors that you need to knock on. And just to summarize what we have just discussed, there, there are three circles of challenge that come across all of us, uh, or people especially who live in the West. The first of them is, is something for all the people, and the second and third relate to especially people who are uh, living in the West. And, and just to recap, that the first challenge is the challenge of your inner self, in which you have to be a person who is always going to do what right is. And that can only happen if you have a strong God connection. So your first challenge is follow the voice of your conscience. Your second challenge is something which is going to confront you from outside. And that is you have to do something in which you contribute in this world. And remember, when you go away, when you pass away, people remember you. And Prophet, Prophet Abraham actually made this prayer to the, to the Almighty and he said that, O oh God, when I pass away, وَجَعَلْنَا لِسَانَ صِدْقٍ فِي الْآخِرِينَ Make others remember me in a very fond way. Make others remember me as if I did something for them. So the second affair is that be a person who contributes something to, in the world and the society that he or she lives in. And for this, discover your talent. Polish that talent. It's, it's going to shine and provide other people with light. And the third circle is 
the circle of your intellect in which you have to use your intellect in a critical way, critical thinking, because that is something which you remember when the, the Prophet was being uh, teased by the Quraysh and by the Mushrikun, and the, the typical argument that they would give is that uh, when the Prophet would say that you have to believe in these facts that I'm uh, bringing before you, they said, how can we believe in you when our forefathers believed in something else? Are we to believe in you or in our forefathers? We're going to believe the tradition whether we like it or not. And that ultimately doomed them. They, they, they were not critical of their tradition. They said because of the fact that they've inherited a tradition, they're going to go on with that. So critical thinking is very important and that is going to really make you a person who is going to contribute in the lives of others. And finally, I've got just two minutes before I sign off. <coughs> uh, let me give you this, uh, this small personal advice which I always give to me as well. As, as I just said that last, uh, in my last uh, part, I just said that you have to have this critical thinking in you. So the thing that is, is very important is that this critical thinking, what it, what it does negatively to you is that you start being very critical of others as well. So critical thinking, thank you, <clears throat> is not something, when I say critical thinking, it does not mean that you start criticizing other people. No, critical thinking means that you crit critically analyze the ideas that come before you or the concepts. And the other thing that I would like to stress here is that don't criticize others. It's, gone, it's not going to do you any good unless they would like to hear the criticism. You see, we have a habit of criticizing people. We have a habit of judging people. We have a habit of passing our own uh, sweeping statements. Keep it to yourself. If you want to judge anyone, let it be yourself. You are very fond of judging people. So you use that very good quality of yours, but not on others, on your own self. Judge yourself because you are the best judge of your own self. Why? Because you have the data. For others, you don't have the data. You don't know the other person from inside. You're just making a judgment from his appearance or her appearance and maybe some scant data. But for your own self, you have every bit of information. So instead of judging others, judge yourself. Instead of solving the problems of the world and, and analyzing, well, Trump should have done this and Imran Khan should have done that. What about Mr. You? What did you do? So you see, it's easy to criticize others and vent your emotions, but it's very difficult to criticize your own self. So turn the telescope inside. Don't start viewing other people. Start viewing your own self. So thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And I, if there is any, are any questions, I believe there is a break now. Yeah. Or so uh, we'll take a 15-minute break. Uh, there's some refreshments there. Please feel free to help yourselves. Uh, when we come back, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, you can just raise your hands and ask questions away, or there is a website link right there. So if you want to submit in, an anonymous question, um, we want to know uh, who you are. So just uh, go to that website, submit your, submit your questions, and I'll read those to Dr. Saab, and he will answer those, inshallah. So just we'll meet back at uh, 1 o'clock, inshallah. Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. So we're back in the session. Inshallah, uh, we'll start with questions for Dr. Shazad. Um, first, I'll you know ask any, if if anyone wants to raise their hands and ask a question live, that'll be great. Otherwise, I'll start going through these questions that you guys have submitted on the web form. No, you do. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So, uh, the, the youngest of the lot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to bring myself you today. Yes. So, uh, Shabi, everybody knows the way to handle stress. But, you know, I've seen what I've noticed is basically uh, kids uh, get stressed out mm -hmm. more easily than the adults. So, what do you suggest how to handle the stress mm -hmm. when it comes down to kids' level? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very good question and this is something which I have seen a lot in my observation with the young adults and uh, um, it's not only stress, uh, it's, I would say it's peer pressure as well. So the stress is caused by, uh, I, I generally think that there are two things or a couple of more things which, uh, which are instrumental in producing produ stress. The first of them is, uh, uh, with, with due apologies, mishandling by the parents. So the parents at times don't realize that there are certain things uh, which they should not be so strict on 
Uh, there are certain other things in which uh, uh, our religion has given the final decision to their children who are grown-ups because of the fact, uh, and this is what we were discussing in the first session also, that one of the things that uh, we have inherited from our culture, from our Desi culture, if I can say this term, is that because of the fact that our parents were generally used to obeying whatever their own parents said without questioning them. So because they have the fact they are trained in that procedure, they, it's like a second nature to them. It's in their blood. So they have the same, uh, they, all, they, they exhibit the same behavior with their own children and then don't realize that it's not going to do any good to them. It's going to con contribute to their stress and it is also going to uh, tell badly on their general upbringing and their, their mental upkeep as well. So I would say that uh, when you see that your child is in stress, the first thing you should do is, or maybe even before that, is that you should have a very, very close r relationship with your child. Something, someone with whom he can confide in. So if your child, a boy or a girl, and he or she's growing up, uh, he has or she has someone in, through which he can actually discuss the problems or the stress itself. So discuss, discussing the stress relieves stress as well. You see, uh, by merely uh, blurting out whatever you have in mind, this is a psychological thing which all doctors also say, that when you share your stress, it reduces. It's not going to go away, but the intensity reduces. So the second step is that if you are a good friend with your children, if you have a very, very strong bond with them and they confide in you, then uh, you will be able to actually counsel them. But what I have seen is that instead of having the strong bond and being able to counsel them, because of the fact that the, the parent generally has this uh, overpowering personality in which he or she would restrict uh, their children without realizing uh, their own personalities, uh, it creates a barrier between the parent and the child. And this barrier uh, is something which actually increases the stress that he or she might be going through. And that is something which is really detrimental because, you see, stress is something which you can bear in your life as you go along. But once uh, you cross maybe your uh, middle ages, it becomes really, really very, very difficult. To give you an, give an example, this thing is not that heavy. I mean, if I start holding this and I, someone tells me that pick this thing up and put it down. So I'll pick it up. I'll say it's very light. I'll just pick it up and put it down. Now someone tells me, uh, pick this thing up and please maintain this position for five minutes. Okay, that's fine. And then he says ten minutes. And then he says an hour. And it, that increases. Remember the weight is negligible. But if it is constantly carried, you can well imagine if I have made to carry this weight for let's say four hours or five hours, in spite of the fact it's, it's no weight at all, I'm going to get really stressed out, really tired. So very similarly, at times, this stress starts with a tiny dot, and you can bear it because your body has the elasticity to do so, as a, my body would have the tolerance to pick up that weight. But if the time increases and the stress level is not reduced, that small amount of stress, that small amount of weight is going to have its effect. So very similarly, parents have to realize that small stresses, they keep on adding. They could be very small as if, for example, something that they would comment on. Uh, so you see, just to give you some more idea, what parents generally do is that they taunt their children. They make fun of them at times. They compare them to other children, which is very, very uh, detrimental. Which is, I would never advise that you compare your children to any person that you would idealize. You see, this is, this is going to cause a further pressure on them. And what our children, parents do, they don't compare in an encouraging way. They compare in a disparaging way. And they would typically say, look, who you are and look who he is or who she is and look at the amount of success that he or she has achieved and look at yourself. So this comparison is damaging. And this damage, of course, is something is not going to work. So the parent has to realize that if the child is not being up to the mark or he or she is a slow learner or there are certain things that he or she is not doing uh, in the right way because of stress, <coughs> then the appreciation of the stress starts with the fact that you make friends with your child, you are in a good term with your child, and you let your child take certain decisions in life. The decision might be wrong, and remember as parents, we ourselves took these wrong decisions when we were growing up, and we learned from our mistakes. So the other thing is that our parents today are so ambitious 
that they don't let their children make mistakes. Then how can they learn? And this is going to further increase the stress level. So stress level is something which is found in the environment. And the fourth thing which uh, further uh, enhances the stress is that I have seen houses, I have seen parents who are very good, generally very practicing Muslims, good human beings. But because of a lack of training of marital issues, they start quarreling with each other. The husband and the wife is always at daggers drawn. And this happens in front of the children. And I can tell you that this is the worst thing that a parent can do or parents can do that they fight or they pick on each other in front of their children. Because the stress that's going to give to their child is something that you cannot imagine. I was once working with a, with a couple of children for their uh, counseling them and one of them was a 10 year old boy and another was a 12 year old girl and out of nowhere we were discussing some things uh, and we talked about what are you going to do when you grow up and etc etc. So the two said one after the other whatever we do we're not going to get married and I said why? And after actually talking to them for a, for a considerable period of time, I came to realize that they would be hearing the quarrels and the pickings of their parents every day. Every single day, the mother and the father, the wife and the husband would, would have some, some uh, difference of opinion that would always be blown out loud. And one thing would be added to this, and that would be the mother would call the, the daughter to her side, and the father would call the son to his side, and it would become a family feud. And you can imagine that you're pitted against your own kin, how it's going to affect you. So you see, the levels of stress have to be appreciated. It's the stress of the environment which tells badly. And as, as I said, I'm a parent myself. I have behaved very badly with my children, as well, with my child. I've got just one child. And maybe that's the reason God only gave me one child. Said so I have been very strict with him in his very early period. And later on, I realized that I'm doing the wrong thing. So it is the stress that you have to understand that it's not they who are, uh, it's, they are the cause of the stress. It's we who are the cause of the stress. And the second uh, area is the peer pressure that you exert uh, in living in this environment. And again, because of the fact that our parents don't uh, realize that this peer pressure is exerted because they don't think or they perhaps don't comprehend that when the children are living here, they are exposed to a different culture. So uh, sleepovers or prom nights or dating or hanging out with the opposite gender is something that's very common. And it's, it's like a routine. It comes as if it's uh, very normal. So instead of uh, maybe making, it, ma making them conscious about it, ma maybe telling them the wisdom or the lack of wisdom or the benefits or the disadvantages, so parents become even more strict. And then what happens is... So that's a, um there are lots I'm of sorry. questions, so if you can... Okay, it's you know, so a very brief, uh, I'm going to briefly end it. And what happens is, because I think it's a very important area, this stress factor, uh, that what happens is that because of the fact that the, your, you tend to get your children isolated from the rest of the class or the rest of the society, that further increases that pressure, that increases that stress. So he or she has a disconnect with the society that he or she lives in. And that can really cause havoc. I have some other suggestions as well, but I think the two major factors of this distress are the parents uh, and uh, the, the, the lack of realization on their part is, is the real uh, problem. I, I wish they do that. Yeah. And realize this problem. So, as in my, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. So, we'll move forward. There's, uh, uh, there are multiple questions on this topic, so I'll just kind of rephrase them into one question. Um, so somebody's asking, Islam is very stringent when it comes to um, how women dress. You mm -hmm. know, for example, it doesn't doesn't allow them to wear short skirts and show skin and things like that. Um, in a non-Muslim country, it's mm -hmm. very common for girls to you know uh, dress that way. So why is that? Why is Islam so, so stringent? I think about that uh, more than Islam, it is this uh, concept of <laughs> modesty which is found innately, whether you are a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or uh, you're a human being. So you see, modesty is something which comes naturally to you. And the levels of modesty, which of course means is they're going to express themselves in the form of the dress that you wear, they vary from society to society. And again, there are a lot of things which are cultural and because of the fact that those cultural things are imposed by our parents without realizing that, there could be some, maybe, some leverages, some, something which is not as strict. Uh, they, they, instead of telling their children that uh, a person who, uh, who, who is God conscious, who is oriented towards the life uh, of, of the goal of higher ideals of life, 
he or she has to be someone who is always very sensitive about uh, certain sensitivities regarding culture, religion, and her own or his own modesty. Because what you are is what you wear. Or the, the type of dress that you wear at times would be harmless to you. It seem, would seem harmless to you. Because, uh, because when everyone is wearing a particular form of dress, uh, it hardly stands out. But you see, you have to question yourself that if this form of dress is something which is being provocative to the opposite gender, or it is something which is going to tell badly on your inner purification, then the decision is yourself to take. I think more than what Islam says, a, a girl or a boy should follow the, again, what we said in the earlier part, the voice of the conscience. What does the conscience tell you in, with regards to your dress? That is the best judge. And if there is any discrepancy, I think this is going to, uh, this is going to, uh, it's going to settle down with time. Because there are certain things that you do in a certain part of life and you're growing up. So this is the time, again, parents come in. So what they do is that instead of uh, maybe telling what the right thing is for once or twice, they keep repeating that and say, okay, you're still doing that, you're still doing that. I think parents need to just convey the, what the right thing is in, in maybe a couple of few words sure. and let the child decide as he or she is growing up and let her become aware of what the right and wrong are in wearing this dress. Again, yeah, so I said it's because of the mishandling of the parents that children think that it is Islam who, which is strict. I think it's not Islam which is strict, it is the parents who are strict. So it's parents' job is to kind of guide their children, right? Yeah, Rather so just than just making like, sure that, you know, It's like connecting them to God. Yeah. So you see, once you connect them to God, God is going to take care of himself. I mean, his, no one is a better person than God himself. Who are we? So our, our job is just to make that connection. Once that connection is made, we must slip out of that, like, yeah. that relationship. It is here that we fall to actually. Okay. Um, does anyone have a live question in the audience? No? Okay. Can you please suggest an easy translation of Quran for the teen? Um, because sometimes it's hard to read the regular transla so translations. So there there's one translation that I, I recommend very highly because uh, I have found it to be very, very good, not only in its linguistic content, the language content, but also the, the person, the translator, has a very good command of Arabic. Uh, and that is by N.J. Dawood. Uh, it's called the Quran Translated. It's available at Amazon as, as a Penguin Classic. And uh, you'll find it in the form of a very 300-page book. At times, there is a text of the Quran in between the translation on the margins. And at times, it's just a translation without the Arabic. Uh, it is the, one of the best translations that I have come across. And if by any chance you are not able to get it, then the second best translation is by Arthur J. Arbery uh, of the Cambridge University. He actually was a contemporary of Allama Iqbal also. He translated parts of Iqbal's poetry as well. So he has, he has also a very good command. So it's also in Penguin class, it's, it's called the, the Quran translated by Arthur J. Arbery. So these are the two highly recommended ones. Uh, other than that, if you're not even be, be, uh, able to lay hands on either of these, just pick up any good translation. It could be any accessible translation that you have in your home. Start off with that. But before you start off with the translation, remember what we said earlier on. First, read a book on selections from the Quran. Because that's going to put you in the right groove. In it the gives right you a context. It gives you the give you, whole give summary. You that urge, it gives you the idea of the, of the content of the Quran. So pick up a translation after you have read a panoramic sort of a collection of the Quran. Okay. So next question is about dua. So what are the rules of acceptance of dua? Um, so uh, uh, there are some do's that we are not aware of because God did not choose to tell us because you see dua is something which is his discretion to accept. But one rule he has laid out in a very strong way in the Quran and that is unless we do our due, God is not going to add upon it. You see dua is an acceptance of our endeavor. For example, if a person is going to succeed in, in his exams and he's going to pray to God and he's not going to work hard, so God is not going to answer your prayers. Because he says that you have to do your share first, and then I'm going to supplement my blessings uh, after you do your share. So if a, if a farmer, for example, does not sow seeds and still says, God, please bring a good crop for me, that's not going to come. So you have to do your part. So the, the important part of the dua is that the thing that you're making dua for, have you expended enough effort in that, in the light of your intellect and experience and morals? If you've done that, after that comes that you pick up your hands and pray to God, that God, I've done my best. This is what I understood. So please make it more fruitful. 
and uh, we are told in a hadith by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that uh, when duas are not accepted they are either stored up for you as a reward or they are stored up for you in, as a reward in the hereafter because for example if you are wanting something and that thing is not being provided to you so either God fulfills your wish as a, as a prayer and that's a big bonus or he withholds it and when he withholds it he either makes that uh, a treasure of reward for you given in this world or compensates you for that in the hereafter so that that's that's the hikmah that we know but other than that it's difficult to say that why God doesn't accept certain prayers because at times he does not accept certain prayers or duas because they might not be good for us ultimately what we think good is not always good in the sight of God so he does not let it happen at times he tests us he, he sends us difficult circumstances and those circumstances stay and in spite of making God they don't go away because he wants to test us how patient we are in, in, this, in these circumstances how grateful we are in these circumstances so as I said, these are multiple reasons. But, but you're still, still, you are encouraged to make dua course, even without knowing whether oh, it's yes. going to be accepted. That is why, because you see, uh, God is going to add on what you do. And he says that if you do your part, I am going to add whatever you have done. But if you don't do your part, then don't blame me. Yeah. So it's like egging on the people, urging people to do what best they can do. Yes, well, that's great. So the next question is, um, they're asking... What are some of the keys to, to becoming more productive and staying consistent? So as I said, uh, to be consistent, the best thing is that to decide a time or a habit at its minimum level. Start off with the minimum thing. Don't start off at the maximum because the maximum is not going to make you consistent. It's going to break away because you cannot keep, it, keep up with it. Consistency only comes when you start off something that you would, would have liked to do in its least level that you can do and then maybe you can increase it a little so that is the key that do something in a small quantity because that would be easy to manage it would be easy to conduct yourself through and once you are you have got a strong foothold maybe you can increase that and what was the other part uh, productive and consistent so productivity as far as uh, that is concerned we just discussed in the talk that the basic principle of productivity is to, to find out the talent that you have. You're going to, because your productivity depends and hinges on your ability. And you have to find who you are, what good you can do, how can you contribute to the society that you live in. And if you are able to find out your inner talent, your prod productivity is going to really, really multiply because that's how God made you. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience right now? No? Okay. So the next question is uh, very interesting. They are asking if they are in a religious argument with somebody else and you know they're kind of cornered. Somebody has a, raises a question that they don't have an answer to. What are they supposed to do? You see, uh, what we need to understand is that debate is something which at times gets the better of you and you want to win a debate. Remember, it's not a question of winning or losing a debate. It's a question of finding out what the truth is. If the truth is something which your opponent or your so-called rival has raised and because of the fact that you don't uh, accept it uh, because, or you have a different view, uh, it's not a question of winning or losing or it's not a question of being cornered. It's a question of what the truth is. If you're cornered because you've heard the truth, then of course you should accept it and you should not call this whole process to be cornered. It is a process in which the truth has been revealed to you. You have come across a new idea. You've come across a new truth. So you see, this mentality only comes into being when you want to defeat the other person mentally. You want him to, to get the better of that person. You want to make him lose. In finding out the truth, winning and losing does not matter. They do not matter. Whoever might come across, he could be a rival, he could be a friend, he could be a, any person. So it is the truth which matters. So you weigh whether that the person who had cornered you is he really telling something which is convincing? If he is, then come out of that corner and accept that truth because that is what is intended. It's not to defeat the other person, but it's to accept what the right thing is. Yeah. So the, the purpose of these discuss this discussions should be to yep. uncover the truth and absolutely, absolutely. share that truth. So right? I, al I always say that because this often happens in interfaith dialogue also where people are discussing the different faiths. So I, I have this motto which I often uh, voice in such meetings and that is, educate don't dominate yeah so instead of dominating the other person you start educating him 
And education actually means that you present your view in a very humble way, in a very cogent way, and let the other person decide. Why do you want to dominate him? Why do you want to make him, why do you want him to accept what you are or impose yourself? Right. That's his business. Right. You educate him and don't dominate him. Yeah. And if they give you, if they tell you some truth, that, you know, that course, becomes evident that on you, then you should accept. Absolutely. So this, it goes for both ways. If you find something to be the right thing and you see the other person tells you, then it's like your own lost heritage. Right. right. It's something of a wisdom that has come across you and you must follow it. Yeah. So the next question is about uh, Hadith. Um, in the Hanafi school, do you know what are some of the uh, tests to make a Hadith? Um, right. So first of all, please understand this, that the jurists, they do not relate to Hadith at all in, in the testing of Hadith. For them, we have a separate branch of scholars which are called the Muhaddisun. It is the job of a Muhaddis to basically test or find out which Hadith is correct or not. Jurists use these ahadiths which are sifted out by the muhaddisun. So jurists don't actually judge ahadiths, they use the judged ahadiths uh, in the application of Quranic directives. So as far as uh, judging ahadiths is concerned, as I said, it's the task of the muhaddisun, not the jurists. And the muhaddisun, uh, the way they have actually given certain criteria of checking a hadith, it's something of a, uh, of a fact that these criteria are so common and they are so uh, so, uh, I would say, in line with common sense and, uh, and textual appreciation that it, they form a sort of a uh, universal principle in testing texts. And that is that the person who is narrating something, you have to find out who he is, uh, whether he has a good memory or not, whether he had a good understanding or not. So this is called Adil and Zapt. Adil means the person has to be trustworthy. Trustworthy means that you just cannot listen to every Tom, Dick and Harry. You don't know who he's, uh, what he's telling. So the first thing is that the person who is narrating something from the Prophet, and of course at times there are several people who narrate from each other. So the Muhaddisun first of all test whether these people are reliable, they are trustworthy, they are honest or not. The second thing that they trust or they test is uh, their, their memory. Because you see when you are transmitting something from the Prophet and you are narrating something from the Prophet, you have to retain it in your memory. What if you listen to the Prophet, you came out of the room and you started something or something slipped away from your mind and you actually inverted this conversation. This happens with us sure. as well. So the second criteria for them is called Zapt in Arabic. Zapt means they have to have a good memory. The third criteria is called Ittisal. Ittisal means that there has to be continuity between the narrators. For example, uh, if I say that I heard this from that person, then obviously that person has to be a person living in my times and someone who is accessible to me. So it, it does happen in the case of fabricated ahadith that at times the person says that I heard this from that. And when it is researched, it is found out that that person was living actually a hundred years before him. He could never have even heard it, what he had said. So the third thing is, the third criteria is called uh, ittisal, which is continuity. The fourth uh, criteria is called shuzuz. Again, these are technical Arabic terms. And shuzuz means that uh, if you find something uh, which is against uh, I would say the established principles of the Quran or the Sunnah. And the, finally, the fifth criteria is called the illa, the illat. Illat means there is a, some hidden defect in the, uh, in the narrative. Uh, apparently, it seems absolutely okay, but there are certain uh, shortcomings in the narrative. And the last two uh, criteria actually relate to the text of the narrative. And the first three criteria relate to the chain of narration of the narrative. I, right. I, so, sorry for being slightly technical because of the fact that That's the question was technical, question. so I had yes. to answer in slightly technical terms. Okay. Um, the next question is, you know, they have friends that are Christian or Hindu. They're asking, mm -hmm. um, what is their fault um, that, you know, this person is born a Muslim, so they will go to heaven, but this, you know, their Hindu and Christian mm -hmm. friends will probably mm -hmm. won't go to heaven, so what's their fault? So the first thing that we have to understand is that being born a Muslim is not going to guarantee paradise for any of us. We have to be people who understand what we are doing. Being birth, uh, being, uh, being uh, Muslims by birth is not something which is going to uh, contribute. It's just a point in which you might have an edge when you grow up so that if you are critically evaluating something, and your own parents transmitted that, maybe it's a step closer towards that critical thinking. But other than that, this, this uh, cliche, I would say, or this principle that all Muslims are going to end up in heaven and all non-Muslims are going to end up in hell is absolutely against the Quran. 
In fact, if you study the Quran, it could be the other way around. A lot of God, non-Muslims would end up in heaven and a lot of uh, no, uh, Muslims would end up in hell uh, because of the fact that there are certain objective criteria which make a person worthy or entitled for hell or heaven. It is not your birthright. It is your conscience acceptance of certain truths that make you entitled. And paradise is not a place for Muslims. It's a place for human beings. All human beings who subscribe to a certain criteria, which is mentioned by the Quran, you become entitled to it. So we have to come out of this jinx. We have to come out of this uh, web that we have actually weaved around ourselves that it is only we who are going to end up in heaven. Right. So it's the conscious acceptance conscious of truth acceptance that will and good deeds. Right? Absolutely. Good deeds. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. So. Um, What's the importance and strength of Nazar? You know, it, there's a concept of Nazar in right. our culture. Um, and how do, you, you know, how do you know what to post on social mm -hmm. media and mm -hmm. not, you know, since you're afraid of So you see, uh, Nazar. there are certain psychological ailments which come uh, in our society. And uh, one of them is ca called the evil eye or the nazar uh, It's uh, It's basically a psychosomatic phenomena. Psychosomatic phenomena are phenomena in which physical things have a psychological effect. To give you an example, when I, for example, praise someone, he starts blushing or she starts blushing. So you see, your physical words, or your, something which is physical, had a psychological effect. So these, these are called psychosomatic phenomena. Psychosomatic phenomena, are, they affect you without your being realizing. So there are certain psychosomatic phenomena which you, have, which you detect, we are able to know. And one of the examples that I just gave was that you know that blushing is caused by when you praise someone. So in a very similar way, although we have not been able to detect that, there are certain things or certain, I would say, premises or criteria which when exercised cause this, uh, this, this, the other person to feel bogged down or feel low or feel depressed. But uh, if that is to be considered a psychological or psychosomatic phenomena, we have to first rule out all sorts of other physical ailments. Because there are at times these, this, this thing in which a person feels that he has been inflicted by the evil eye, it could easily be some other ailment that can be first ruled out or which have to be, has to be ruled out. For example, hyster hysteria is a very common thing which, which, uh, which is one of the causes and there are other medical ailments as well. So before jumping to the conclusion that you have been inflicted by the evil eye, you have to first rule out the other physical ailments who, which might be the cause and a good doctor and a good psychiatrist would be uh, a good choice to discuss. It's only when you rule out everything and you find out that nothing is probably uh, working for you or there's something that uh, is besides that, that should induce you to think that there is something else which is wrong or perhaps it is caused by this evil eye phenomena. So this evil eye phenomena, if it is to be there, it is something that you have to actually first rule out in the case of other things. And now if you ask me that what is, the, what is your defense against your evil eye? How should you combat an evil eye? Again, the Quran has told us that because of the fact that this is a psychological sort of an effect on you, the, the way in which you can combat an evil eye is to bring yourself in the refuge of God by praying to him as much as you can and asking him, hey God, protect me from the evil effects. So the last two surahs of the Quran, the surah Falak and surah Nas, if you read them, they have exactly the same theme. They, they, they are an expression by the human being towards God and he asks the refuge of God, I ask, I, you see, it's the refuge of God which is sought in these uh, in the last two uh, surahs of the Quran. And then there are certain supplications also of the Prophet, uh, which are of the same meaning, which tell us that God protect me from things which I am not able to detect, which are unknown, but they are bothering me. So those prayers should also be done. And one other tip that I might give is that uh, try to be in the state of uh, ceremonial ablution in the state of wuzu as much as you can because that keeps you pure that has a psychologically pure effect on you and uh, people who are who remain in the state of wuzu uh, it is believed that they stay away from such things as well although it's not a guarantee but it's an experience that you can share very good does anybody else have the last question uh, from the audience okay so it's 1.30 and um, you know, we're going to end our session here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Dr. Shahzad is very accessible on Facebook, YouTube, 
so please go ahead and follow his page and uh, his YouTube channel. Uh, he has a lot of education, a lot of content online all the time. So if you're not following it, you're missing, uh, missing out on a whole lot. Second thing, um, to stay up to date with our um, events at uh, GCIL, please uh, follow our, our page on Facebook, Gandhi Center of Islamic Learning. Um, and inshallah, you know, you'll stay up to date with whatever events that we are having here. Uh, once again, thank you so much for coming. We're going to have Zohar prayer uh, and then...